morning, Chairman Sweeney, Chairman Dodd, and members of the committee. Thank you for convening this hearing that is a topic of such concern to all of us in New York. Hydraulic fracturing relies on pressure, water, and high volumes of inherently toxic chemicals to shatter the bedrock beneath our feet and beneath our drinking water aquifers. And once shattered, the bedrock releases more than just bubbles of gas. The rock itself releases inherently toxic materials that have been bound together with the shale for millions of years. And as we in New York consider whether to permit or prohibit this form of energy extraction, I think it's essential to consider the consequences to public health. Once shale is shattered, it cannot be unshattered. Once groundwater is poisoned, it can't be unpoisoned. Some of the chemicals used in hydrofracking or liberated by it are carcinogens. Some of them are neurological poisons with suspected links to learning deficits in children. Some are asthma triggers. And the radioactive chemicals actually bioaccumulate in milk, which is an issue for us here in the dairy state. Others are reproductive toxins that can contribute to pregnancy loss. And of course, cancer, miscarriage, learning disabilities, and asthma are not only devastating disorders, they are expensive disorders. They add rocks to the pocket of our healthcare system, <coughs> and they cripple productivity. A recent analysis just published in Health Affairs estimates we spend $76 billion a year just on health care for children due to their exposure to toxic chemicals and air pollutants. So it's right that we should ask if hydraulic fracture brings with it involuntary environmental exposures, what we call toxic trespass, that might increase our disease burden here in New York. So I applaud you for initiating this conversation. It feels to me that this is a historic moment. My name is Sandra Steinreber. I'm the Distinguished Scholar in Residence at Ithaca College. My PhD is in biology from the University of Michigan. Now, early on in my career as a biologist, I had a profound personal experience that led me to the work I do now, which is focused on understanding how the cumulative impacts of multiple environmental exposures to toxic chemicals create risks for human health. At the age of 20, I was diagnosed with bladder cancer, which turns out to be a quintessential environmental cancer with well-established links to chemical exposures. And questions about my possible environmental exposures were actually posed to me by my own diagnosing physician while I was lying in the hospital bed, exhaling anesthesia. Uh, and these questions led me years later to return to my hometown in Illinois and investigate the uh, alleged cancer cluster there. Among other things, I discovered that my hometown drinking water wells contained dry cleaning fluid. And that was a surprise, because the underwater geology of the area should not have allowed toxic contamination to happen. But there it was. And with that discovery, I came to appreciate how little we really know about the unmapped subterranean landscape beneath our feet, which has intimate, unseen connections to the world above ground. It turns out it's not just an inert lump of rock down there. My investigations into the environmental links of cancer became a topic of my book, Living Downstream, which was released last year as a documentary film. I've published two books on pediatric environmental health, the most recent of which is uh, Raising Elijah, Protecting Children in an Age of Environmental Crisis. Uh, the book's final chapter addresses the potential health threats of hydraulic fracturing, and I'm pleased to describe uh, some of the results of my research with you. So I'm just, um, in a very quick way, going to overview uh, with you uh, threats from uh, exposures that come to us from air, and then from water, and then from food, and I'd be happy to take your questions. Because uh, breathing is our most ecological act, we actually inhale a pint of atmosphere with every breath we take. I'll start with air. Air pollution is an inevitable consequence of hydrocarbon. It's not a risk. It's not the outcome of an accident that may or may not happen. Compromised air quality is a certainty with hydrocarbon. With 77,000 wells envisioned for upstate New York, each one of which requires 1,000 truck trips, 1,000 times 77,000 equals a number that has six zeros after it, which makes for a prodigious amount of diesel exhaust. And of course, in addition to the endless fleets of 18 wheelers, gas production requires generators, pumps, drill rigs, condensers, and compressors. All these things run on diesel. At the same time, the wellheads themselves vent volatile chemicals, benzene and toluene. These are also highly toxic, and they actually combine with combustion byproducts to create smog. And we actually know a lot about smog. Um, this kind of air pollution is lethal. It contains ultrafine particles, soot, ozone, and the carcinogen benzoate pyrene. The adults these pollutants are linked to bladder, lung, and breast cancer, stroke, diabetes, and premature death. In children, they are linked to premature birth, asthma, cognitive deficit, and stunted lung development. 
And they have a almost a very high price tag. Uh, premature birth is the leading cause of disability in the US. It carries with it a $26 billion price tag, and asthma an $18 billion price tag. And of course, to uh, air pollution in the day, the gas pad can travel up to 200 miles. So children in Albany will be affected, children in New York City will be affected, in, in places where no one is benefiting financially from land leases. Uh, water pollution is also uh, an issue, and each one of us in this room is 65% water by weight. We all enjoy an exquisite communion, not only with the atmosphere, but with the water cycle as well. We know that there are many documented cases of surface and groundwater contamination with compounds associated with gas extraction, including the carcinogen benzene. But because hydraulic fraction is read in the environmental equivalent of diplomatic immunity, enjoying special exemptions from our federal statutes, it's difficult for those of us in the research community to quantify what the public health effects are. We lack knowledge about the behavior of groundwater, and we also lack knowledge about the uh, trade, kind of trade secrets we don't know what companies to test for. We do know, um, in study of the early days of month, that drinking water wells near a gas extraction sites in Pennsylvania and New York have, on average, 17 times higher methane levels than uh, wells located outside the gas patch. We don't know about the health effects of drinking and inhaling methane are for pregnant women, for children, or for anyone. Not because we've done the studies and there is no evidence for harm, but because we've never done the studies. We do know that when we fluorinate water that contains carbon-based contaminants, we create these infection byproducts called trichloromethanase. One example is chloroform. Um, and these exact are percentages linked to both bladder and colon cancers. Can methane serve as a raw material for the creation of trichloromethanase? To my knowledge, we in the scientific community don't yet have an answer to that question. Shouldn't we answer it before we proceed with hydrogravity? So I brought with me here a jar of water from my kitchen tap in the village of Trumansburg. And this water comes from a municipal well sunk into a groundwater aquifer near Kaiser Bay. Every day I pour this water into glass and hand it to my children and they take a drink before they get on the bus. And every day this water becomes their blood plasma. It becomes their tears. It becomes their cerebral spinal fluid that surrounds their brain. And according to the annual drinking water quality report for this water uh, in my village, it contains some cryomethanes in the fluoridation product process. And it also contains nitrates that are probably the result of all the farming they do um, near uh, the well. Um, and, and their presence in this jar all by itself is not all for alarm, it's all within the legal limits. But it is a sign that our municipal water, as so much water in New York, comes from an unconfined aquifer that's vulnerable to chemical contamination. Already, this water has fertilizer in it. It's, and the, the, the presence of this fertilizer shows us that there exists hidden connections between the surface of the earth and the water revolves of groundwater deep beneath our feet. What would happen to this water if the fields that surround my village, many of which are already used to the gas industry, become a staging ground for fossil fuel extraction? In Thompson County, where I live, 40% of all land acreage is linked to the gas drillers. This is not a hydrological experiment I am interested in running. I've also brought with me a loaf of bread and a bag of flour. Both of these are made from heirloom wheat and rye that's grown in my home county and milled right in my village. This is called uh, farmer ground flour, uh, and this is the bread that my local baker made out of this flour. You can find similar loaves of our supplement bread made from the same flour in Brooklyn Bakers. It's part of our uh, uh, economy in upstate New York to bake bread. And this particular loaf was actually created by a baker named Stephen, uh, Stephen Senders of the White Lake Bakery in Mecklenburg, New York. And Baker Senders asked me to submit this loaf to you as his personal testimony to these numbers today. So this loaf of bread is the testimony of a baker. And it comes with the following message. And this is what Stephen says. Please tell the assembly that bread is mostly water. The flour and the yeast in this bread are just a matrix to make water stand up. I can't bake bread without a source of clean water. He also told me that the flowers who grew the organic wheat to make his flour are surrounded by loose land. He believes the whole farm to enterprise, the whole farm to table enterprise is threatened by fracking. And Stefan and his farmer suppliers have reason to feel concerned. Organic farmers who raise food near fracking operations are facing potential boycotts and will lose their certification of their crops and animals are chemically contaminated. Is this a public health issue? I argue that it is. 
Uh, it, it, actually, upstate New York is a national hotspot for organic agriculture. Uh, cows, wheat fields, vineyards, maple syrup, and uh, apple orchards, all of this is part of our public health system. They're part of a healthy food chain. And each of those crops requires clean water. They are all affected badly by exposure to air pollution. So to conclude, I fervently hope that these hearings are the beginning of an essential conversation. In its current incarnation, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation's draft supplemental environmental impact statement on which the future of hydraulic fracturing hangs considers neither health consequences nor the cumulative impact of numerous hazards that gas flow has brought to our doors. The human health impacts of fracking can't be understood by looking at one chemical by itself, not looking at one river at a time, nor by looking at one well had in isolation. We all know that it's not just the last straw that breaks the backs of the camels. So I urge the assembly to look at all the straws, uh, employing the new tools of cumulative impacts assessment to do so. And until that work is complete, I believe the benefit of the doubt goes to New York's children, water, cows, and wheat fields, and not to the things that threaten it. Thank you.